Oh, hello. I'm Kevin Alcuni, a librarian here in the Exploration and Creativity Department at the Los Angeles Public Library. And I'm here to welcome you to today's LA Made, an afternoon with T.C. Boyle. First, we'd like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind the scenes staff for helping bring the LA Made programs to you virtually. Thanks, Steve and Diane. LA Made focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. If you'd like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapl.org slash events. And for our LA Made programs, specifically visit lapl.org slash LA Made. Our website also has blog posts, video links, and all other kinds of fun things that highlight the library's diverse resources and upcoming programs. Now on to today's program, An Afternoon with T.C. Boyle. Uh, and moderating today's conversation will be Karen Pickford for also affectionately known as KP4. Karen has been with the Los Angeles Public Library for over 15 years, where she has served as a young adult librarian, senior librarian, and for the past five years as a principal librarian for the East Valley region, and is currently the principal librarian too for the Library Experience Office. That was a lot of library words in there. I mean, um, oh, and then, of course, the man we're here to see, uh, the man of the hour, the tower power, T.C. Boyle. T.C. Boyle is an American novelist and short story writer. Since the mid-1970s, he has published 17 novels and 12 collections of short stories. He's recently been the recipient of the Mark Twain Voice and American Literature Award, the Henry David Thoreau Award, and the Jonathan Swift Prize for Satire. He is a distinguished professor of English Emirate, Emirates, oh, sorry, I screwed that up, at the University of Southern California and lives in Santa Barbara. Now let's welcome Karen and T.C. Boyle. Yay. Hello. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> You're welcome. How are you? Well, I when I woke up this morning, I felt myself all over, and I think I'm still at least partially alive. <laughs> Good. Are you going to start us off by reading? I would prefer, Karen, if we chat a bit and set up the reading. Could we do Okay. That? Sure. Absolutely. What do you want to talk about? Talk to well, me. I would like to talk about any subject relating to literature, but specifically today, my literature, and even more specifically, my new book. Well, as, as a super fan, super fan of yours, it's really a privilege to be able to do this. And I burned through this book. It's, I mean, I've always, I'm, it, I've always thought how funny and smart and just thoughtful your book is. And this one, I think, comes at a perfect time in the city of Los Angeles because it's about how human it's about communication and it's also about human interaction with them with each other and with another so to me i don't know it, it sparked a lot of thinking for me on a lot of different levels okay good well let's set it up for those who are viewing this is a mm -hmm. book in which i've gone back to the experiments in the 1970s to cross foster a chimpanzee in a human home without any respect to its knowledge of its own species, raise it as a human being as a language experiment to see how uh, an animal can learn language. And a chimp has the uh, intelligence level of a three and a half year old child, which I've got one running around here lately, uh, who's only two, which is pretty high. Um, these experiments, the hope was that we could communicate on a, deeper level with an animal than, you know, to tell the dog to roll over and good boy. Uh, could this, uh, these animals communicate something to us about our lives and our beings and how language can f form a world uh, that we're not aware of? Uh, it were conversations. It worked. It was great. But by the you know, 80s or so, uh, a lot of the enthusiasm began to peter out because really that kind of revelation just doesn't exist. Because 
all other creatures have their own ways of communicating. For instance, with the chimpanzees, they have a highly developed gestural language. Uh, they don't need us. <laughs> if we hadn't captured them and put them in caves, uh, cages, and uh, you know destroyed their environment, well, they'd be perfectly happy uh, and perfectly well suited to regulating their own thoughts and emotions and being. Uh, in some senses, I've often thought that our ability to do what we're doing here is a kind of evolutionary dead end. We needed our language skills in order to dominate the world, feed ourselves. But now it seems that uh, we've gone way past the helpfulness of communicating in language. For the survival of our species, that is. Uh, don't read the newspaper. Don't think about it because everything is catastrophic because of what our species has done. So anyway, I have gone back and written a drama that is also kind of amusing about how this might have gone, what these experiments were like, what it might mean. And the most fun I had with it was alternating chapters I present from the point of view of the ape in question, and his name is Sam. Yeah, I love the the alternating that you did in Sam's voice and in Amy's voice and you know, the professor's voice was great. And also the, as we refer to him as the big creep, his voice. So I'll be, I'll be, it'll be fun to hear your voice. Okay, well, all my books don't necessarily have a villain. This one has a guy who could be cast as a villain. He is the guy who breeds the apes and uh, lives off of selling them. But in this little piece I want to read you, it's the first time you hear Sam's point of view and his voice. And here's the situation, which makes this very sad, by the way. Um, all the apes you see in the movies and in these experiments, they're all juveniles because a chimp is twice as strong as any man on this earth and independently minded and driven by hormones as we are. And he doesn't want to have lessons and be uh, told what to do. And so by the time they're adolescents, they're far too dangerous. And so here's an animal that lives to be 50 years and is then confined to a cage ever after, at least in those days it was, or used in biomedical experiments. So in this case, Sam has been raised by uh, a, a professor who's running these psychological experiments and linguistic experiments and uh, 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 a student who works with him and cares for Sam as a mother might. And uh, uh, at some point, he outlives his usefulness. He becomes too large. Uh, and also Moncrief, the guy running all of this, decides that this is all bogus and we're going to pull him back and just put him in the breeding facility. So he has been raised as a human being with love in a, in a house with his room and his toys and everything else. And then suddenly he goes unconscious because he's been injected with a drug and he wakes up far from his home in California in a cold place uh, <laughs> in Eastern Iowa. Uh, and he is bewildered and doesn't know where he is or what's happened to him. And I will just give you a little taste of how Sam reacts to this. This chapter is called Key Lock Out. Excuse me, let me just prop this up a little more steadily. He didn't have a word for words, or not yet anyway, but he knew words all the same. He knew key, he knew lock, he knew out. He was a prisoner, though he didn't have a word for that either, and even if he did, it would have been meaningless. What did a word, any word, have to do with this situation, in this place, in the onrushing, unstoppable cataract of now, and the fear, afraid, it came with it? He had diarrhea, which existed as a pain in the gut, a stench, a hot, wet squirt of shit that needed no terminology and no afterthought. He wanted his blanket, a blanket, any blanket. He was cold. He was distraught. 
He rocked from side to side. He stared at nothing. He plucked the hairs from his arms, his chin, the crown of his head, trichotillomania, and he didn't know that term either. How could he? And what would it matter if he did? Would that get him out of here? Sleep was his only release, and it came to him in a blaze of shuffled images. The bathroom light so bright it was like the sun in the sky, a trickle of blood-warm water in the tub, and the face of the one who meant most to him, whose name he'd invented in the gesture of pinching his right nipple in the way he pinched hers when she was with him in the bed, and they were both warm and his shirt was on the floor. But then he woke, he always woke, to the screams and the reek and his own diarrhea and the food he refused and the din of flesh pounding on metal. When he was thirsty, thirst came to him as a sensation, preverbal, nonverbal, and he picked up his cup and drained it. He didn't think, drink, didn't sign, drink. He just drank. Until the cup was empty, that is, and no one came to fill it for him. Then the word was there. And the sign, the gesture, thumb to the lower lip, descriptor and request, both. And when no one listened, when the cup went unfilled and the box, the cage, the prison he measured over and over with the length and breadth of his body spoke despair to him, spoke rage. He screamed, he screamed, he screamed. In the morning, that was no morning at all because there were no windows in this place and the lights never dimmed or faltered. They came with food for him, food he didn't want, food he refused. And he compacted his own shit in his hands as best he could and flung it through the bars at them. They didn't like that. They backed away, cursing in their alien voices. And he held one hand under his chin and waggled his fingers, cursing back at them. Dirty, dirty. That didn't help. Nothing helped. He worked at the bars with his hands and his feet, too, but the bars were cold steel. The bars were immovable. And every time he looked beyond them, he saw more bars and barren walls and moving shadows till he shrank down inside himself. What had he done? Where was he? Where was his bedroom? Where was his house and his bed and his tree? Where was she? And why had she allowed them to bring him here? He took it as long as he could, huddled in the back of the cell, the box, the cage, and then leapt to his feet, clung to the bars and screamed and screamed again until the big man came through the door and every voice in the place fell silent. It was as if there had never been a voice except his echoing down the corridors and reverberating off the bare walls. But of course, he didn't know that word either. The acoustic signifier, only the phenomenal it represented. The physical effect that evolved eardrums and cochlea and neural pathways. The big man was coming, and he had the stinger in his hand, which was called a cow prod. Though that formulation was behind him, too. Hurt, he knew that. And he knew cow, the big, lumbering, night-black creature that solidified the shadows in the scrub out back of her house. Of his house. The place he used to be before this. But that didn't do him any good because the big man with one eye, with the black eye patch that was like a hole drilled in his head, rose and swelled and touched him with the stinger. And suddenly he was writhing on the cold cement floor beyond the reach of words now, except hurt, except afraid. Thank you. And that's the... That's the opening for Sam, or is that the closing for Sam? That, I mean, that just puts yeah. you in it. Yes. And the first chapter is from Amy's point of view, and it tells you how she saw an ad in this college newspaper for an assistant, uh, this professor wanted an assistant, and you see how she um, uh, has an immediate uh, connection with, with Sam and is his chief caretaker as we move on through the novel and of course she is very disappointed that he's been taken and put in this cage and she determines to do something about it well she gives up her life for sam i mean in a sense she you know she that's the whole thing she's capable like how much can you love an animal hmm. good just question one of Excellent the things question. yes how much can you love an animal how much can they tell me Yes, absolutely. And so um, I have a dog and I have a cat. And every night when I go to sleep, 
I have a very beautiful, uh, sweet smelling, great ape sleeping beside me. And I love her too. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's another question that we ask about animals and can we have true affection for them and can they have true affection for us and how is that expressed i think another thing that comes up when you have to think about it is you know also what you said about nature and nurture and then you have you think about chimps in the wild that are nurtured and are able to nurture and then you think about when they're taken, when someone's taken from their environment and that all falls apart. Yes, absolutely. But again, in terms of science and scientific experiments, really people never gave much consideration to this. I think we're a lot more humanized now and sensitized towards these issues and towards the way we treat other creatures. Um, you know, I do mention Claude Bernard in the book the uh, vivisectionist uh, in France of the 19th century who made great advances in showing how the blood circulates and so on and how our organs work. And he did this by vivisecting dogs. And here's a story I include in the book of what Claude Bernard actually did. To him, animals were beyond the pale, just as, you know, you go to the meat market and there is a slab of dead animal and you don't think about it. But it, it, he was so insensitized to this that uh, he was once for his students, he had dissected a dog without his anesthetic because the anesthetic would interfere with uh, the progress of all the organs and so on and so on. And so, uh, you know, it took a long while to dissect the animal and the lecture was only half done. And so without even thinking twice, he just left the animal cut open and staked to the board for next day's class. So, I mean, we've, we've come a long way from that, but I also ask this question about these, uh, these experiments with the apes and what their value is uh, in terms of uh, ethics. Well, I mean, in, do you mean sacrificing animals for the survival of people, for the cures for disease? Ethically, that's, I mean, there has to, are there other ways to do it? Is that the only way? I mean, it made me, I thought of Sam as human all through the book, sort of had this human quality, but it's, it's, you know, he was like the perpetual grandchild forever. I like, that. I like that very much. I, I did want to humanize him uh, so that we can see uh, animals in a different way. And I should say too, that, you know, if you were to read all of my books, I think you will have a very good idea of what I stand for and who I am, but this is all has to be in the background. I don't believe that fiction, art in general, should uh, try to persuade you of some political point of view. If you want to do that, write an essay, uh, give a speech. But art is a seduction. And I am interested in creating a story that will engage you. Uh, I happen to be, you know, very much environmentally interested and socially interested in many, many issues. And so these are what I tend to write about. But I'm not trying to persuade anybody of anything. I'm just creating a scenario for my own benefit. I want to know how do I feel about this? And in the course of it, I hope that uh, I'm creating a story that will engage you, not simply on the level of story, although that is primary, but in terms of the kind of conversation we're having now uh, regarding the issue of not only of uh, how we relate to the other species on the planet and uh, you know, by extension, how we are destroying the environment for them and for us at the same time. I wrote down, so I did a deep dive the last couple of months into a lot of your books. And I mean, I just wrote down themes, sort of amazing. Uh, you know, immigrants, the 60s, identity theft, the deaf community, mental illness, environmental awareness, um, historical fiction. And then your short stories are even more wild. And, and those are really fun to listen to. We have that at LAPL.org if anybody wants to check them out. And I just wonder, what, how, do you, how do you get a story? Like, how do you think of, of a story or a subject? Do, are you running around with a notebook? Do you think, you know, did you go to the zoo and think, oh, I want to write about Sam? What's it? Tell me, how do you do that? 
I love like what you're saying, Karen. This is this is my method, of course. Um, uh, uh, unlike I think most of my contemporaries, I have remained dedicated to the short story, even as I write novels. So I'm working equally in both arenas. And as you are suggesting, the stories give me a chance to be completely wild and bounce off the wall. Uh, uh, a story can come from anything I hear or read. It can be said anywhere with any kind of characters. I just want to see what it is. I don't know what it will be. I just take some idea and run with it. Uh, a novel is a little different in that it usually requires some research uh, into a subject, in this case, of course, the, uh, the language experiments with the apes, or uh, in the uh, my last one, which is sitting here somewhere, um, outside looking in, which has to do with uh, the uh, early days of LSD. I had written Drop City about the hippies, as you mentioned. Uh, uh, I do this intimately. This was the late 60s, uh, you know, using LSD and drugs and so on. And where is that culture coming from? What did it mean? Could you really drop out of society and improve things? Uh, and so with Outside Looking In, my last novel, I decided to go back before my time and see how the LSD experiments grew out of the uh, late 50s and early 60s with people like uh, Ken Kesey and, uh, and, and specifically in this case, uh, Timothy Leary. So yes, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the novels do require research and the research is enjoyable. For those uh, listening and, and watching us, um, everybody has written a term paper, at least, or something, has written some, something, whether it's creative or factual. And it's the same process for me. I engage some material. Maybe I need to go someplace and see something because I set my books in many different places. Uh, I take notes, as, as you point out. Um, and here's my notebook sitting right here of the thing I'm working on right now. Um, but usually, I didn't even go back to look at the notes. I think the process of writing the notes out somehow allows my unconscious to imagine what a scenario would be like and how it might move forward. And then I begin to find a first sentence and follow that first sentence. Now, of course, <laughs> and I'm in this position right now with the novel I'm writing now and 240 pages in, uh, you never know if it will turn out and you you take a huge risk at all times you don't know if it will ever come together however when it does it's a great thrill it's the thrill of making art and feeling that uh, it's worthwhile and that um, you're not a failure you don't have to commit suicide it's okay <laughs> have you, i have two questions have you written since you were young i know you mentioned you were in a band uh, so I grew up in a working class family, and here we are talking about libraries, by the way. Libraries pretty much saved my life. We didn't have books or a traditional book, although my mother would read to me. She taught me how to read. Um, I didn't really know about writing. I guess I had gotten through school because I was a good writer, but I didn't really think about that or know about that. I went to SUNY Potsdam in New York. I grew up in New York, which is the music school. Uh, to be a musician. I played saxophone and clarinet. But I flunked my audition because they expected us to play music that I had no feeling for, that is classical music. Uh, I could play the hell out of my instrument. I could stand on my head and, and, and I could sight transpose. But I didn't really have a sense of rhythm or the power and beauty of the music, which I know now, of course. I listen to classical music all day long while working. So I put my saxophone aside and it was a liberal arts college. And I went, uh, I declared a history major. I had always done well in history. I was fascinated by it. Uh, and in the second year, we had a class in an American short story and I read Flannery O'Connor's um, A Good Man is Hard to Find. And then I declared a double major, history and English. And in my junior year, I blundered into a creative writing classroom and found my metier. And so uh, this is why for so much of my life, I have taught in the university because I had many great mentors. I had many opportunities and doors opened uh, intellectually for me. And I wanted to provide the same and keep our culture moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just talking today about the importance of 
how one person can influence someone's life and change their whole direction. So one of the most rewarding things of what I do is to hear from people who read my books. And, uh, you know, when I do a live show, I will talk with everybody. I love them. I am honored that they want to talk to me and they read my books and are passionate about them. And it's always so wonderfully stimulating because um, I will meet people who say that a given story had changed their life or been so important to me uh, mm -hmm. or they met their wife in the bookstore, you know, both buying my book. All those stories are so wonderful, but I can't imagine how that would be because I don't know what, who my readers are or what they want or, who, or what they do. I am just creating art and I am so gratified. And as I say, honored that people take a deep dive into them and we and I can have conversations with them in the way that we're having a conversation now. It's thrilling, actually. And, you know, people often say, if, if you couldn't publish, would you write and produce work anyway? I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. know. Uh, uh, the feedback is so important. And I have been lucky in my career from the beginning, critics and uh, fans uh, uh, took note and, uh, and propelled me forward. Uh, on another note, I have never, I am just a literary writer. I'm just an artist. I'm just trying to do uh, my work and, and, and view the world and try to interpret it through, through my own lens because it's so confusing and horrifying, actually. Uh, um, I've never uh, written for a film. I've never written in order to make money. I've never written for a, a contract. I have simply uh, uh, gone my own way and created my own work and been very fortunate that somebody cares about it so many people care about it i mean reading is such a personal journey for anyone who picks up something and i think it's just it's amazing have the breadth of all of the things i thought about when i was reading this i mean everything love you know relationships children it just goes you know the world it's it's really wonderful and i and i find that in a lot of things i mean i read tortilla curtain a long long time ago and it just really i can I, it still impacts me because we're still going through the same situation in so many yes. ways yes. all so, these problems go forward and move forward with us like the uh, pandemic which i predicted in uh, a friend of the earth back in 2000. i have a question about your windows Yes, I can see. So I read the women and so did a dear friend of mine. And um, I'm wondering, do you have is that a craftsman house? And did you buy it because of the women? No, the other <laughs> way around. The other way. Oh. around. This is uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's first California house. And uh, we have spent the last 29 years to, trying to keep it from falling down. And as soon as we moved in, I thought I should learns more about the architect and uh it took me several books before i finally got around to doing it the women was in 2009 uh the uh, centennial of this house and it was a joy for me because i could dive deep into another artist and and um who he was mm -hmm. another fascinating person which brings me to the question who do you read who's a big influence on you in terms, of, in terms of fiction, I'm coming from the writers who were popular, uh, literary writers who were popular when I was a student and in my formative years. So, of course, people like Franz Kafka, Garcia Marquez, Borges, uh, John Gardner, uh, Robert Coover, uh, Gunter Grass. Uh, all these writers of a, of a large canvas and often with an absurdist or uh, darkly humorous point of view. And if you look at my first couple of books and, and particularly my first uh, book, Descent of Man, uh, these are very wild absurdist stories. And I still write things like this. But as I developed into a novelist, I began to uh, appreciate the role of character in fiction more than in a given story, for instance. In the beginning, I was more concerned with, with idea and design and language. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm not now, but uh, I came under the influence of John Cheever, who was my uh, teacher in Iowa, 
workshop and Ray Carver, who was a friend of mine uh, there hanging out in town, Ray, in those days. And Cheever was, of course, in outer space in many ways, but he also wrote in the realistic mode as well, and, and, and Ray only did. And I saw that, and I also wrote some stories that were straightforward, strict realism. Why not? I feel I don't want to um, be put in a corner and have to repeat myself or do the same thing over and over. And of course, <laughs> the fans of my first books always said, well, why don't you do more of that? Well, if I did that exclusively, uh, I would have shot myself by now. Uh, you've got to be stimulated artistically and, and, and find new modes uh, or try to. So, for instance, you just heard me read from Sam's point of view. Well, I'd never tried to write from the point of view of an animal before. It was great. It was a challenge. I really enjoyed doing it. Um, and, of course, as you heard, it's a kind of trick. Mm -hmm. All fiction is a trick. You enter the world, as, as you say, Karen, and, and you recreate the world. You film, you film the book in your own head. Uh, but um, you... You have to make the character in your own image. And uh, uh, you saw in the, the reading that there is a narrator standing behind it. We're very close to Sam's point of view, but there is a narrator explaining things like, well, he didn't know the term trichotillomania because this is a book about language and about words and the power of words. So um, <laughs> all of these things I can talk about in retrospect, but in the process of composition, it just happens and it just feels right. And I never have an outline, I never know where it's going, but as I proceed day to day, I have revelations and I see things and I see where it's going. And as we said earlier, uh, when it comes together, it is a thrill. For instance, uh, some people watching may know my essay, this monkey, comma, my back. This is a story about writing and uh, a monkey on your back. And I liken it to um, a drug addiction. So that when you do get to the end of a story or a novel, it's the exhilaration is, it rockets you, just rockets you because you feel it's right. And you feel that with all the tension and the worry and everything you've done and all the work you've done in the past year or however long it is, uh, produce something, something out of nothing and it feels great, but it's like the rush of shooting heroin. Once the rush is over, you got to do it again and again and again. So it's my way of talking about um, the metier of being an artist. You mm -hmm. can't stop, it's, uh, it's thrilling. I don't even feel right unless I'm actually writing something. Are you always writing something? Do you ever take a sabbatical? Have you ever taken a, I mean, 17, 18 books and I don't know how many short stories? I'm working, uh, next year will be the stories. I, I walk between the raindrops. That's my 30th book. I'm working on the 31st now. Um, in short, no, no. Um, ever since I grew up, and by that I mean I stopped doing drugs and being a degenerate and a lunatic and went to Iowa, which saved my life and got me out of New York. I got my PhD there as well. I have gone straight for it. Uh, life is too short to waste. I just want to find out what's next. Every book is exciting. Every story is exciting. As I said, I'm, you know, struggling away uh, with this new novel, uh, maybe um, two thirds done. Uh, every day is a challenge. Every day I'm trying to move forward uh, and looking beyond that to another period of writing short stories because I'm lucky in that I do both. Uh, most people I know who are just novelists, there's a long parturition process after you finish a long work, you're exhausted and what are you going to do next? And uh, I don't know. But with me, I am storing up ideas for stories and they're not they're not ideas that are uh, well-developed. It's just a line or two, a story about such and such, or a clipping from a newspaper or whatever. And mm -hmm. once I'm done with the novel, then I will begin to look through that. And if I'm lucky, I begin to write stories. And so that the new book of stories, I Walk Between the Raindrops, is written like all of mine in two periods, one before the novel and one after the novel. 
So this was written uh, after uh, Outside Looking In and before Talk To Me, the first half of it. And the second half I wrote prior to beginning the book I'm working on now. So I read one of the short stories and it focused on, I don't remember the name of it, but it was about, I mean, it was, it was very current to our society that just has to have things or, you know, everything is an acquisition. And you, do you know which one I'm talking about where they went to a therapy for um, spending? And Filthy for with things. Yeah. Filthy with things. My first uh, New Yorker story, it's an absurdist and hilarious piece about people who uh, have the accumulating disease. I happen to live with one who's given me an elegant life. <laughs> if we could show the camera down there, everything is elegant. It's beautiful. But there's no end to stuff. And of course, stuff is the death of, uh, of our species. So yeah, I had fun with that. And uh, what, did, uh, what did she think of it? Uh, she's rather stoic. I mean, to be the wife of a comedian or the mother-in-law, you're going to take some abuse. But um, she knows that my heart is pure-ish. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so uh, that story and, and many stories uh, set contemporaneously give me a chance to address what's happening in society uh, immediately, which in a novel, when you're locked into a different period or a different story, you can't necessarily do that. So, for instance, um, here, uh, in the Rhythm Box, so the title story here, it's about uh, our obsession with computer games. And in this computer game, it completely takes over your life. Uh, another story is, uh, are we not men? Uh, the line coming from uh, Orson Welles, of course. And it's about uh, my discovering of CRISPR-Cas9 technology, which enables us now to quite quickly and much more easily make transgenic creatures. Is that a good idea? Where does it end? How would it be? And so these are kind of stories that stimulate. I mean, another story in there is called Surtsey, and it's about the island of Kivalina off of Alaska, which is being inundated by the rising seas. Well, what is that like? Mm -hmm. What happens? What would it be? So often I'm asking myself a question in these stories and finding a scenario to try to dramatize what it might be like or to, make, to have fun with it. Both the stories I just talked to you about uh, the Rhythm Box and Are We Not Men are, are comedic stories, but I think also <laughs> they um, they should uh, disturb you deeply. Disturb, yeah. disturb is the right word. Um, do you have what is your what is your thing with Alaska? You set you know several stories and a novel there. What what is is that sort of the last frontier that's being destroyed or one one among many? Well, Drop City it goes back to 2003, and I did spend time in Alaska at that point. Uh, I think it was John McPhee who turned me on to Alaska with Coming Into the Country, a brilliant book. Uh, yes, yes, of course. The world is shrinking. Uh, there are uh, almost 8 billion of us. There is no wild anymore. Uh, you know, soon we will only have commensal creatures around, and all wild creatures will be extinct. Uh, so, of course, I'm dreaming of what it might be like to have unfettered nature. I uh, have all my life spent a lot of time in the Sierras up in the Sequoia National Forest in a small community there. And uh, what I get from that is to be able to walk out the door after work and go deep into the woods. I never see anybody. I don't have anybody come with me except the dog. Uh, and I just want to feel nature. I bring a book. I go to some of my favorite spots by a creek or, uh, you know, overlooking uh, the valley and uh, just feel, just feel what it's like to be a creature in nature uh, for hours every day. It's, it's, it's exhilarating. It's, uh, it's natural. It feels great. Um, and even here in, uh, in suburban Santa Barbara, uh, I get out every day and, and hike and kayak and swim and try to be away from society. But, but I'm not a misanthrope. I mean, I love to go to the bars and hang out with people and tell jokes and all of that. But there's a balance. There is a balance. And for me, the balance really has to incorporate 
time in nature, quiet time, just observing things. That's where the ideas grow or the ideas start. I don't know if that's true. Uh, <laughs> maybe on some unconscious level, I don't know. I'm just feeling. You know, Wordsworth talked about this uh, in terms of uh, being a child and being uh, a child in nature before we are acculturated, as with Sam, as with talk to me, uh, we are natural beings. We don't know about death. We don't know about the corruption of society and uh, the misery <laughs> that life will bring us. <laughs> so uh, we're pure, we're just pure. And uh, to go in nature is to kind of, by yourself, alone in a wild place, is a way of, for me, of kind of recapturing some of that magic. What, you know, on, what these, you, Karen, I, on these walks, yes, I see that the bark beetles are killing the trees. You know, uh, I know the names of the trees. I know the names of the creatures and so on. But I dismiss all of that. I'm just walking out there and just looking and saying, oh, my God, look at that. Or what is that? Or let me investigate this in the way of a child. I mean, this is why it's so, um, I think, uh, sad that so many people, particularly urban people, don't have an opportunity to do something like this and to feel what it is. And of course, they, don't, they may not want to, they may not have any experience of it. But if they did, I think it would be uh, tremendously calming for all of society. <laughs> I agree. Um, when you said you got your PhD at the and in Iowa, University you, of Iowa, yes. The university. Did you go there for the Iowa's Writers Workshop? Yes. So and again, I speak. Of love. Uh, I was just a kid, a degenerate, crazy, hippie, lunatic in New York, doing all sorts of things. But unlike most of the uh, degenerate hippie lunatics I hung with every single day, I was reading a lot and beginning to write short stories. And by a great miracle. One of them got accepted for publication. And on the strength of that, I applied to the IRA Writers Workshop, the only workshop I'd ever heard of. And uh, they accepted me. And I put my uh, girlfriend, now now my wife, uh, a dog and two cats in the car. I'd never been west of New Jersey. And we found Iowa City right there on Highway 80 and spent five and a half years there. So uh, from the beginning, uh, when I got there, I began to take PhD courses, and uh, it, it turned out being 19th century uh, British literature because I had a great mentor, uh, Frederick P.W. McDowell, who turned me on. And uh, I felt, you know, if I was going to write novels, it would be helpful to actually know something. Mm -hmm. uh, Achiever, who was my teacher at that time, who, you know, hated academia. He'd been kicked out of uh, the Thayer Academy for smoking when he was 17. And he was one of the most erudite people I've ever met, but he hated formal education. He ragged on me about this all the time. An artist doesn't need such an education. And maybe not. Uh, you know, everybody is different. But I really felt I needed some kind of foundation. And to have those years free to study mm -hmm. literature and read everything I could and write about it was, I think, enormously valuable to me. And I, I wouldn't, uh, I would, if I were to go back, I, I, I would certainly do it again. Uh, yes, you could say that the MFA is enough. It's a terminal degree. Uh, that's, that's as high as you can go. Uh, but I needed something more. I needed this, this, foundation which i think is reflected in my first novel water music you know this long wild romp that takes place in uh, the late 18th and early 19th century it's about mungo park the uh, scottish explorer who was the first european to discover the niger river and i could uh, rely on uh, or call up a lot of the wonderful things that i had been able to read as a student when you were teaching, which was what, the last 30, 27 years, you said, 37 years? Uh, a mere 37 years, yes. <laughs> so what was the most interesting thing or the what struck you the most about teaching? Well, I miss it because right. I miss the ability to do what we're doing right now. 
talk about literature with informed and excited people. Uh, these were the students. They were great. I loved them. We would just have our sessions and talk about all topics, uh, you know, deriving from whatever literature we had before us. It was truly great. Uh, the students, creative students, like the musicians, uh, sculptors, the writers, they may not be the ones who score the highest on the aptitude test, but they're brilliant because they have a special talent. And to see that special talent is very exciting. So um, I was asked to remind everyone that if you would like to have a copy of Talk to Me, let's see if it sees there, that we have an opportunity drawing if you email ECDEPT at LAPL. There it is, LAPL.org, the magic elves behind this stream yard. Um, so that's, you can win one of these, and I highly recommend winning it and reading everything possible that you can get your hands on that TC has written because everything, everything is really powerful. And you know what, what I have to say, and I think I was telling Kevin this, like to me, some of your novels are like thrillers. I mean, I literally cannot put them down because they're just, they're so exciting. So I don't know. I wondered if you thought that I'm delighted. I'm just writing stories, and I do have a strong story sense. I always have, I think, and uh, the story is the foundation, and it's all important to me. And I'm, I'm delighted to hear that. I would, you know, I'd much rather hear that you read them as if they're thrillers and you can't put them down than you use them instead of Samanex at night. You know? <laughs> this is really great. No, no Samanex from. And by the way, Karen, we should, re you know give a warning to everybody that this book will break your heart. Oh, I I this book, I was sobbing into this keyboard right here. In fact, I had to throw this one out and buy a new one because it was saturated. It is sad. It is sad. And it's also sad. We should probably get to questions right now, but I found it very interesting. You know, Amy is sort of, she's, she's sort of psychologically withdrawn you know, in her life and her relation. It, it's all very interesting. You guys just read it. Yes, okay. I made her. I made her. She's a very small person. And she's That's an right. introvert. And I did this consciously as a way of, uh, of allying her with the other creatures. It's fascinating. So we're going to open it up for questions. And I'm going to read some for the last 15. I think we only have 10 minutes. We've gone on. Uh, from Mark Horton, TC, I am a big fan of your novels, but the short stories especially. How does your process help you work through what might be part of a novel or what is destined to be a short piece? I, I, I think I compartmentalize. And so as we said earlier in this discussion, I only work on one thing at a time. I've never tried to do two things at once because I'm afraid that I won't finish one of them or maybe either of them. So, uh, I have a period of writing a novel when it's over, then I have a period of writing a story. I have never had the experience of taking a story idea and expanding it to a novel or vice versa. So it's a, there's a kind of rigidity there, I guess. I don't know whether this is good or not, but you know, anyone who gives you advice about writing or books about how to write and so on, throw them all away because they're completely irrelevant. They can be exciting in that they tell you how this particular writer writes or what he or she thinks. But as far as, you know, being a how-to for you, there is no such thing. You just have to engage yourself and your talent and your mind on a subject and let it fly. And of course, the other way to learn how to write is to read deeply of writers whom you love. So you're not necessarily imitating them, but all of their methods uh, are absorbed through the reading and you are going to be an amalgam of everything. All art is coming from all other art. That's just how it is. That's right. uh, from Pamela, I'm interested to know if you have been informed and affected by any animal rights philosophers, such as Peter Singer, and more specifically, the Great Eight Project, which I think you did, you did mention. Yes, uh, both uh, inform this book and, and Peter Singer is mentioned. Uh, again, I first came across him 
when I was writing A Friend of the Earth, which is my book from 2000, which projects to 2026 with regard to the destruction of the environment, global warming, and the pandemic. And uh, yes, I've been very concerned all along. I have written short stories along these lines, like Carnal Knowledge about the eating of meat. Uh, uh, so in short, yeah, absolutely. Are you a vegetarian or a vegan? Not entirely vegetarian, but close. I primarily eat, eat vegetable matter, and I know it's hard to decide ethically uh, but I certainly will not be eating any cows or pigs or lambs or anything like that. Um, it's a matter of choice. Uh, on the other hand, it's tough because I live with a carnivore who eats whole herds of animals every <laughs> week and says when I object that, uh, you know, I'm at the top of the food chain, so I'm going to enjoy it. <laughs> oh, yeah, by the way, in this new book that I'm writing, which is projected from now into the near future, it's called Blue Skies. Uh, uh, I am fascinated by many new developments, including the fact that we can now grow actual meat in a lab from culturing cells from the animals. Now, we're, we're in the beginning stages. It's very expensive, et cetera. But imagine if that could happen in 50 years from now, then no more cutting down the forests for cattle fodder, no more of these this cow flatulence, <laughs> which is contributing to global warming. I mean, this would be a great miracle if we could do that. Another question is, we'd like to know, someone would like to know how you pick your titles. The titles just come to me and I, I uh, every book but one, make that two, every book but two began with the title that it has. I need to have some sort of organization. I don't know what the story will be, but I like to have a title and an epigraph and a sense of how many sections the book will have. Will this be three sections or four sections? That from the beginning, you know, as I'm just typing along and getting ready for the first line, it, it helps ground me in some way. Um, uh, the same is true with the stories. Uh, very rarely is there any change of title. The title is important as a, a way of unifying uh, everything that's going to come. Uh, another deep dive of your books, Cassie, says, since you mentioned 19th century literature, are there any 19th century books writers that are particular influences or any that you think are overrated? Hmm. Well, I was reading uh, the novels of the 19th century, primarily the British novels of the 19th century. So George Eliot and, uh, and uh, the Dickens and so on, uh, but also the poetry of the 19th century. So, you know, not only the Victorians, but, uh, you know, all the way back to the Romantics and the beginning of the 19th century. Um, I think the poets influenced me as much as anybody, you know, the Romantics especially I loved, and, uh, and the Victorian poets too, and Matthew Arnold. Or, I mean, you don't know what your influences are. You just absorb. Another question that we have, which is a little strange, um, would you rather have the wisdom of a 50 year old at age 25 or the body of a 25 year old at age 50? Wow. Um, I had zero wisdom at the age of 25. I was just a, a wild berserk human being. Unfortunately, I didn't kill anybody or get killed myself, but I was, uh, was way out there. Um, now, of course, I have the great wisdom of my years, and what I believe now, is the truth of human existence, is that everything always gets worse. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see what else we've got going on here. Um, oh, this is, this is one from Kevin. Would you rather be a bird or a mountain? I'd rather be a bird. I would rather be alive and uh, especially a, a, a creature that uh, doesn't foresee its own death and lives in the moment. Mm. Great answer. Mm. Favorite books to read to your kids when they were little? Uh, I loved the Royal Doll books. 
uh, to read to the kids. But I also read them adult literature, great literature, when they were ra relatively young, 11, 12, whatever. Uh, uh, Catcher in the Rye for my daughter was transformative. Uh, actually, for all three. I have two sons as well, for all three of them. Uh, some years ago, at the Hammer Museum, I gave a reading with my daughter, who is a writer and filmmaker, and I introduced her and she introduced me. And in her introduction, she said that she had only seen me cry once. And it was when I read the end of, of Mice and Men. And that's relevant now because I certainly had that book in mind when I wrote the climactic scenes of Talk to Me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're going to take one more question from the audience. Katie writes, were you always drawn to nature or was it something that came to you as an adult? And I know you touched on your walks and times with nature. But I think, I think choice A from the beginning. I grew up uh, in Peekskill, 30 miles outside of New York City. But in, when, we were, when I was three, my parents moved two miles out of the city limits into a development that was just being built uh, on farmland. And it included a huge wild woods. And so I was a regular kid. I played with you know, ball with all the kids and ran around. I was a hyperactive, crazy kid. But I also spent a lot of time in the woods, usually with other kids, but even sometimes alone. And even as a little guy, uh, I don't know what compelled me to do that or what it was, but I do believe it's what we talked about earlier. It's the need for an animal to be in nature and not necessarily in a high rise uh, with the air conditioning on. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings us to the end. I don't know if uh, Kevin comes back on or how we end this, guys. Let's look in my private chat to see what they've said. I thought we were going to end it with a with the, the big nope. party, the big party where we give everybody hors d'oeuvres and buckets of champagne. Champagne we have right here in the library all the time. This is another thing about having to do a real <laughs> show instead of a live show. There's no green room. <laughs> well, let's hope you let's hope with the next book you can come to LA Made in the uh, Taper Auditorium because that would be amazing. I and will certainly do it, and uh, that book should be out next year. We can have drinks before, during, and after. No, 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 no. no. Wait. Oh, wait minute, Kevin. okay. Uh, I'll wait. I, I was a young man in the era of the bad old writers of the past, and I won't name them, but mainly male. And they were drunk at all times. They were oh. drunk before the gig, during the gig, after the gig. And a couple of times, I really saw writers embarrass themselves on stage. So I would never consider being in any state but the clear state line to perform, but also to write as well. Mm. Uh, I don't want to mess with it. I want to give a show. I want to great to do the best I can. Afterwards, it's different. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All bets are off. Um, well, I just want to thank both of you. It was a great conversation. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, spend it with the library today. I really appreciate it. It's My been pleasure. a pleasure. And thank Kevin you. and Sharon, you're both brilliant, and I love you. All right. Thanks. <laughs> thanks to both of you. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us for today's LA Made program. And remember to check out the library's online calendar at lapl.org slash events. And don't forget to check out the next amazing LA Made program on Thursday, October 28th, where we will be presenting Life on a String. Enjoy this guided overview of the library's latest exhibit, Life on a String, the Yale Puppeteers, and the Turnabout Theater. It's also a great exhibit here at the library as well. Uh, Christina Rice, Senior Librarian of the Library's Photo Collection and Curator of the exhibit, will provide background on the exhibition and talk about how three puppeteers from Michigan started a theater using discarded street car seats, helped spark the career of an African-American folk singer, and performed alongside the Bride of Frankenstein. Okay, until next time, we truly do appreciate all your support. The success of LA Made and all of our library programs could not happen without viewers like you. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Have a great day.